Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. The Institute offers NARM practitioner trainings for mental health professionals who are looking for advanced training in complex post-traumatic stress disorder. The Neuroeffective Relational Model is a cutting-edge, innovative approach for resolving CPTSD, addressing attachment, developmental, relational, and intergenerational trauma. I'm your host, Sarah Buino, and I'm delighted to have you join us today. On this episode of Transforming Trauma, we're going to share a conversation between Dr. Heller and Dr. Christina Bethel. Christina Bethel is a professor at Johns Hopkins University in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she advances an integrated science of thriving, focused on the recognition and healing of developmental and collective trauma. She has sparked and shaped the conversation to make safe, stable, nurturing relationships a matter of public health and policy. She is an avid student of the human potential for flourishing amid adversity and is dedicated to the implementation of the National Prioritizing Possibilities Agenda to address childhood trauma and promote the relational roots of well-being in policy and practice. She writes poetry, dances, and believes that attuned connection with ourselves, life, and others is the source of our creativity and joy. Dr. Bethel is on the board of directors for the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice and is part of the team of trauma-informed advocates who developed a brief, a trauma-informed agenda for the first 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration. This brief outlines executive actions for the Biden-Harris administration to address trauma and build resilience through the country. The brief begins, we must build a culture of healing in our nation to overcome the collective trauma we're experiencing. COVID-19, the economy, and political divisions are the latest traumas that perpetuate a legacy of suffering in our country. She's collaborating with Dr. Heller and a nationally known pediatrician in a major paper to reach out to primary care physicians and pediatricians as part of that outreach. We believe the world needs healing from trauma now more than ever before, and we're excited and hopeful to see how trauma-informed action can begin to heal the collective trauma the world is experiencing. Hello, Christina Bethel. Welcome to Transforming Trauma. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, and we're also joined by Larry Heller. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Christina. So this is going to be an interesting episode of the podcast because we're talking about trauma from a research perspective today. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to hear about the work that you two are doing together. But before we dig into that, Christina, would you first tell us more about you and, and who you are in the world? Great. Well, I am a person who's experienced trauma, for one thing, and have been on a healing path since as long as I can remember very gratefully because I got exposed to some opportunities to recognize that trauma, to engage in practices early on in my life. And what was apparent to me early on was that we really were not living in a society that understood the roots of our health and well-being, which had a lot to do with the experiences we had in relationships as children and how that plays out into health behaviors in our bodies and So I just was on a pretty strong trajectory and am a professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, leading an effort to put adverse childhood experiences and childhood trauma, but more importantly, the healing and prevention through safe, stable, nurturing relationships into policy and practice, and really trying to do the hard work of figuring out how to measure things so we can research them, so we can assess the opportunity and need and then start to really, really scale the innovations and healing into common practice in the front line. Can you give an example of what that looks like, how your policies influence what pediatricians do then? Absolutely. So for example, there are guidelines for preventive services in the country that are actually required to be met through even the Affordable Care Act and are not. So how do I know they're not? Because we develop measures to assess that. So we can say it's not happening, that we're promoting family resilience and parent-child connection and looking at social determinants like alcoholism and mental health problems and emotional neglect or emotional abuse. So now we know what's happening more in families, their needs, and the gap in quality. So we can start to put in place strategies to measure performance and support improvement in a very succinct way and make sure that it's paid for. So that a pediatrician is both given guidance and also is held accountable and paid to do well, but is also supported. 
supported with the innovations and resources they need to be able to improve in those areas. So a lot of our healthcare is very physical, like coming in to be weighed and to get an immunization, but not to do the core of well child care or core of primary care, which is to really promote well-being mm-hmm. by promoting safe, stable, nurturing relationships, which is where the science tells us is the most important. So not ignoring maternal depression, looking early and often at risk and being able to make sure that frontline teams and the communities they're in are empowered with what they need to address that. And there's a lot of shifts that need to happen in practice and training to make that happen. So, you know, we'll work with Medicaid and health payers and others, but to do that, you have to have the research first or they won't even listen. And Mm. when I started my career, there was no data because there were no measures. So we didn't know anything about how children were doing in the country. So I had to kind of back up to that. Wow. (laughs) Wow. And Larry, you know a lot about Christina's work. And I know you you said she may not sing all of her own praises. So is there anything that uh, you want her to make sure listeners know about her? Yeah, because again, I think it's difficult for all of us to sing our own praises. But <laughs> just to say that, Christina, that, you know, I know that you have a very high profile, both in terms of research, as well as implementation. And I know you testified before Congress and you're at Johns Hopkins, which is no small feat in itself, that you're really in a a position of being able to influence the trauma-informed health care movement going forward. And Christine and I have been talking for some time about some of our shared vision of the future. And I just actually found out right before we started recording this that you got some funding and that this project that Christina and I have been talking about, about bringing NARM-informed, trauma-informed information to pediatricians and to primary care physicians. Christine has now been able to get some significant funding for that. And we've got plans to write a paper together with, is it okay to say the person's name? Or yeah. Is- mm-hmm. Well, the person who's leading the American Academy of Pediatrics statement around issues of toxic stress, which is now being turned into promoting relational health. So that's how big the shift has happened. Instead of talking about toxic stress and trauma, Mm. we're talking about promoting relational health. And so he is now very much shifting the conversation nationally with our help because we're working closely. And so my dream is that you and he and whoever else can, can really write something very, very succinct and coherent to, you're right, it's not just pediatricians, it's family physicians, it's also osteopaths and really all the people who see the front line of families, especially with young children, which have about 15 visits per year, just for well care. So it's really a huge opportunity to shift the population health. And it's really consistent with what we've been doing at the Institute in terms of our online basics training course, which is the other trainings have been primarily for psychotherapy and Mm -hmm. clinicians, Mm -hmm. uh, psychotherapy professionals, and the OBT trainings have been for all healthcare professionals. And we've had a lot of nurses and physicians Mm -hmm. and other people getting interested in NARM and being introduced to NARM really through this, what we call the OBT course, the online basics Mm -hmm. training course. So it's just been a kind of an interesting synchronicity. Yeah. Well, and I think it's really important that we focus on the relational component of the therapeutic engagement and the opportunity by bringing our presence and attuned selves to families, to parents, to children, because there's also a, another movement that I see of people wanting to continue to make this just all about our biology, that we're information processing systems. Mm-hmm. And if we can create certainty, we will fix it instead of understanding what I say is we are the medicine. There is no way to do what we need to do without engaging our own hearts and being as the front line of the screening device, like your own being can sense whether something needed and you're the first round of intervention through your own presence. And that is something I think a lot of people understand, but it's a very pivotal time to make sure that we don't go into a approach to dealing with childhood trauma, which is now on the agenda finally after so long and try to medicalize it to the point where it's not handled in the way that we know it needs to be. And also not separate it out as a psychotherapy because so many of the kids that need help for primary or secondary prevention, they are not gonna get referred. So how do we upbring these principles way upstream in addition to of course having them for those with complex trauma? 
one of the appreciations I want to share with you, Christina, is that you really, with both your professional background, you've got a lot of hard science background, but you also bring this personal element, having done your own personal work, seeing it through the lens of a human being and not just as a scientist. And there are really so few people who bridge that gap. And I think that's why the work that you're doing and that you're so willing to share your own story and, and background yeah. in the position that you're in. It's been so helpful for what we're all trying to, to do here. So Yeah, well, it's great because I've gotten a chance to experiment with everything. Um, <laughs> and also, I couldn't really talk about it. And I've been in medical schools primarily. And it's only really been recently that I feel like it's an asset to talk about it more publicly. But I do think that actually a great deal of what needs to be done makes complete sense neurobiologically. But the gateway to inactivating that and sustaining healing is relational. And I think that's really what's key. And it made a lot of people uncomfortable. I was in a meeting and people said, you're making people feel uncomfortable talking about adverse childhood experiences as if it were inappropriate. Right. And that was just a few years ago in a state that mm -hmm. now is leading the nation. So it's been a really interesting process of having to be very vulnerable and yet keep the course. So it's been a lot. I will say, too, that a lot of the cognitive understanding was pretty far along for me early in life. But it's very much the somatic and relational process that has really helped me the most. And so I think I'm also very, very keen on making sure that we just don't ever allow this to be sort of like, oh, give them a blue pill or a red pill and everything will be okay. There's certainly a cohort looking at that. Yeah. Can I ask a question there? Because I really love how you're emphasizing the relational piece here. And what you said earlier was in order to do what we need to do, we have to have the research first. And I'm just thinking about, you know, I'm also a professor. And so evidence-based practice, that's what we're teaching all the kids these days coming through school. And yet one of the drawbacks to evidence-based practice is manualizing treatment. Right. And that's one thing that I personally appreciate so much about NARM is that it's not in any way manualized, but yet there's still a framework around it. So I'm just curious if you have any idea how they may operationalize yeah. when relational work it cannot be manualized. Yeah, right? no, I mean, that's pretty much the story. I think that we're looking at common elements and principles of practice and core competencies to be able to then relate within the structure of a complex system. So in any complex system, the only way to really manage it is through simple rules. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's we have simple rules and principles that then allow you to show up in any pr particular case with the skills and those rules kind of in place. And then it becomes very emergent. And so that concept of common elements approaches where you have common principles and skills is really something that also is being infiltrated into a lot of healthcare and a lot of public health practices where you, you teach principles and competencies. And then it's really making sure that in the moment you do everything you can to show up and be present. Mm. Yeah. So manualizing really works when you're taking blood and finding a piece. And, but even when we do that, we often don't see the results, even when it is something like diabetes, which you can measure and give a prescription when it's successful, people self-managing, even with the medication you give them, it's all about the relationships. And so the studies are really clear that if we don't engage people in trusting relationships, their self-care, even on things that are purely biologic treatments are not going well. Yeah, that's a really important point. I think the challenge that we've faced in, in our culture, and both I agree with what you were saying, Sarah, and what you're saying now, Christina, is that it's challenging with this emphasis on evidence-based when you don't have a manualized or a protocolized kind of process, the scientific support for it is more challenging when you're just talking about principles and how you then measure how these principles are impacting real life human beings. And so right. that's a challenge. And, and that's something you and I've talked about and something I'm hoping that we can make some kind of yeah. progress with. And well, I think we can. It's interesting that there's a lot of manualized processes that have been studied. And then when they peel the onion on those, what's really actually making it successful are these common element of pieces. So I think we need to flip mm -hmm. the paradigm. And it's really, I think would be great to very much articulate NARM and in terms of its principles and simple rules, if you will, and competencies. 
and be able to study it in a way or even synthesize existing literature. Because I think if you do, if we did the work, Sarah, to look at the literature now and synthesize it properly, you'll read piece after piece that does this program and that program. They're all different, but they're not. If you really mm -hmm. look at it. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you look at what are the core elements that keep showing up. For example, patient-centered care. Why does that matter? Well, it's all about emotional connection and empathy. Mm hmm it's about a lot of things, but it keeps popping up, but we kind of ignore it. So there's a lot we can do. It would be such a great thing to do with a study with NARM. I, of course, would love that as, as well. And really what I have tried to do is to both simplify our understanding of trauma as well as humanize it and take it out of the area of just either neurotransmitters or personal mm -hmm. history, that there's more here at play and that we, those are all important. These are important elements, of course, but they tend to crowd out the other elements of the picture. And we don't look then at the human aspect of all these dynamics. Well, that's also making me think about, I work in addiction and I've worked with a lot of medical professionals who struggled with addiction. And so I've just heard a lot about the training process and how the hierarchy and the top down structure and that you have to know the answers and what you're talking about is really the antithesis of that sort of training. And I think you even said we got to flip everything on its head. Mm -hmm. I mean, this would really turn inside out <laughs> what what some doctors are expecting that they're supposed to do when they graduate. So. I don't know. I, I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts about the way that doctors are trained and, and the way that oh, yeah. we're approaching healthcare in this country, period. Definitely. I mean, there's a number of medical schools now. The foundation of their training is to train compassion. Mm. Wow. There are studies that show 40 seconds of compassion, which we can define. And it has a lot to do with presence and just being present with what is, with kindness neurobiologically changes your patient, reduces stress, and allows learning to occur, allows connection to occur, allows whatever else you're trying to do to actually be successful. But it's the prerequisite. And so in Texas, there's a whole medical school based on that. And it's really a lot of research. I mean, there really is research here. So training compassion, which then of course we know relates to our own relationship with ourselves is being presented as the core. So it's not a sideline. We don't have patient-centered care over here as a side nice thing. It's actually mm -hmm. at the center. It's kind of like rewiring Maslow's hierarchy and putting the connection at the center and that that's the place from which everything else evolves. So I see that a lot. And there was even in JAMA recently, we tried to get a paper published in 2007 on mindfulness and presence and healthcare with a lot of, even though I'm not an MD, I work with a lot of people nationally and have been trying to get a bunch of them together. And the top leaders were trying to publish something on mindfulness and pediatrics and connection and the science that was already there. And it's finally coming through. So I do see it turning, it's on its head and ACGME requirement for doctors are- What is ACGME? It's the American uh, Graduate Medical Education Requirements for Education. So basically what do you have to train people so that they can get an MD and what do they get tested on? has a lot on mind-body, but that still mostly relates to making sure they're educated about the mind-body sciences. And that's where a lot of these neurosciences would come into play. But their own relationship and their ability to create trusting, mutually respectful, compassionate relationships is being integrated much more as a requirement. Now, of course, you can't mandate people to have authentic presence. <laughs> No, you cannot. <laughs> but I do think everyone's capable of it. I agree. I don't know if this ever came out in our previous conversations, but as I was listening to you, Christina, you kept talking about connection. And the original title of the Healing Developmental Trauma book, well, do you remember, did I tell you that once? Or you well, you didn't tell me all of it, but I think I saw an earlier version. I Googled you and I saw it earlier, like cover page or something on connection, but it, what was it called formally? Connection, our deepest desire mm -hmm. and greatest fear. Yeah. Now it only becomes our greatest fear as a result of our adaptations to developmental trauma, yeah. because one of the primary, the broad stroke category of adaptations that we all make to developmental trauma is to disconnect. Mm -hmm. We either disconnect from our bodies, our emotions, our needs, there are other 
elements to that, but it, when we look at it just in terms of the large organizing principle here, it's that we all as human beings long for connection, but we've learned in our adaptive survival style mechanisms to run away from connection and to be afraid of connection at the same time that we're longing for it. And that's what we talk about as the core dilemma. And, um, so your work aligns with the vision that I've had myself for what I've been trying to do in the psychotherapy field. And now to see now that we're expanding it to other helping professionals, it's just an exciting time. Well, that's why I'm so excited to engage you and others who have been on the front lines of innovating around how we can actually help people to start to translate that because there tends to be a gap between people who are really helping people in a more mainstream way or clinically and those that are trying to help set policy and, you know, decide what gets paid for and we even what gets researched. So, you know, you have to actually have a application opening to be able to even apply to do a study on this. And that's taken a lot of work. So we're there for sure. And the word connection, the word presence, all of these things are now conversations, but I think there's a real danger in having people want to figure out how to fix it. Mm -hmm. How do I biologically assess trauma and find a pill or something? Not that there aren't some of those things, but I think that we have a catch 22, Larry, where a lot of the people who are engaged in this also have their own experiences of trauma mm -hmm. and are at different stages of awareness of their own adaptation. And so we have to have that meta awareness of how we're connecting around trying to promote connection. And it's a fascinating conversation and policy that I've been trying to deepen the dialogue basically to make sure that we stay connected as leaders in a healthy way, or at least don't re-traumatize ourselves. One of the things I wanted to just say too, is you asked in some of your questions before I got on about what the biggest challenges were. And I think for treating complex trauma, and first of all, it's the awareness and the recognition that it's there, but say you recognize it's there, we get further along that, which is happening. It's really engaging those that we want to help in their own healing process and the self-stigmatization. So as you know, when you've had trauma and you have the longing, but the resistance to connection because it's not safe and the adaptation, we can put everything on a silver platter and people will not show up, especially youth and certain people. And so we're having a really big issue right now of now having more resources and services presented and people not showing up not wanting to come. And it's not necessarily because those services aren't done in a thoughtful and caring way. It's the self-stigmatization that is that self-criticism and I'm not okay that I need help in this area. So we have a lot of, I think, public awareness to do to normalize and make it safe to be able to come forward and get the help available. I agree with that completely. And I'd like to add to that to, for a significant part of the helping professional community to also normalize their own, just as you pointed out, that they're, they're also carrying developmental trauma. I was asked in a training this weekend if I thought anybody didn't have developmental trauma. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there's a huge difference in degree, but I don't think anybody escapes right. without some That's right. That's right. developmental trauma. And it, that's not really the issue. That's part of the human experience. But when we run away from it, when we deny it, and we can do that, we can build all these elaborate systems actually to keep ourselves distant as healthcare providers of various kinds from our own personal dynamics that are important for us. What I find so interesting, and I'm curious what you think, Larry, is given that we study positive childhood experiences, so not just adverse childhood experiences, and try to figure out what makes up a positive experience, recognizing that that can occur along with the trauma, and how can we create the buffers in the, and what makes up most of the positive experience is how we're met when things are hard. And so being able to recognize the need and be able to be connected to when things are hard, that actually brings the most sense of positivity into us. And so in some ways, what's hard for us becomes the positive because it becomes a way that we can connect in meaningful ways with other people. And what I'm curious is why this tendency to want to avoid bringing our own humanity in at every cost. And I'm just curious what you think that's about, because I see it. I review a lot of papers that try to get published and there's just an onslaught of papers that are trying to 
look at childhood trauma and developmental trauma and talk about it as if it could be treated objectively. Well, again, I think that speaks to what I was just mentioning is that our fear, you know, and people who are doing this kind of work and this kind of research is not acknowledging their own fears of connection, their own fears of vulnerability, their own issues with even having compassion for their own suffering. So I think that one of the challenges that we run into when we start to move into building awareness culturally and in various helping professions around the importance of, of developmental trauma. And mm -hmm. one of the little exercises that I like to do in my trainings is like to the orientation of really humanizing developmental trauma. So it's not just this abstract kind of theoretical piece. But so one of the ways that I do that, like in, in the training is I might do a demo with somebody, like I did a demo with this person this weekend and it got clarified in the course of the session that it wasn't that she was trying to please her parents. For her, that was out of the question. In the inquiry that we did together, it got clearer that she was just trying not to displease them. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And so I took that and used that example as a way of inviting therapists to reflect for themselves. If you're three years old and the best that you can do is not to displease the primary caretakers around you, what do you have to do on a, an emotional level? What do you have to do on a bodily level? What do you have to do on a cognitive level in order to adapt to the reality of that mm -hmm. situation? Putting yourself in the position of this three-year-old child, and it brings it home to many people. Yeah. But, but this is not some abstract thing about neurotransmitters. This is about human beings. Right, I'm not, exactly. I'm not dismissing the importance of your neurotransmitters. I'm just saying when we focus on that exclusively and miss the human element. That's right. And so to put ourselves in that position of asking ourselves as clinicians, what do we need to do? How do we have to distort our relationship with ourselves? How right. do we have to distort our relationship with other people in order to survive in these difficult situations? And to have that as a standard awareness building, even in clinical practice or training, so, you know, in some ways, it's like, what do you know? The coherent narrative is sort of the way we understand that there's healthy attachment is looking at the mom's ability to have a coherent narrative. And so that's the predictor of healthy attachment is that mom is able to do that. But it's not mm. that she's fixed it all. It's that she can say, you know, I grew up in this way and this is how that impacted me. And here's how I think it might impact my mothering. And here's what I want to do about it. So it's different than someone who says everything was fine in my childhood. You know, I mean, there was some, but it was okay. That's not a coherent narrative. So really understanding ourselves instead of even fixing it and having that coherent narrative is so key to being, I think, a good parent, of course, but also any kind of good doctor or therapist. But it is really something to break up is also it makes us the happiest when we can be ourselves and have no idea of being perfect. But that's what patients, I've done probably 300 focus groups in my career with families of kids with special needs in particular, and the bulk of whom have some kind of trauma, about 65 to 85% of them, depending on the economic group. And the biggest problem families have in their relationships with their providers is that the providers won't admit that they don't know and that they right. basically are annoyed at the family if the family doesn't just get it and do it. And they don't really realize the relational piece. It's like, they just won't acknowledge here I am with you and I'm not sure what to do. Let's figure this out together. Being able to even acknowledge we're on the edge of innovation in addressing what we're at, we're addressing. And that's an exciting place to be for creativity. But if your bigger concern is to be safe and look good all the time, then we're never going to get there. So it's very important, Dr. Heller, and I have to say it's timely because the issue's now up. There's a lot of people trying to come in and simplify, oversimplify mm. that childhood trauma is a matter of prediction error or you know, something like that. And what you just said in the, in the question that you asked earlier, from my perspective, as well as the little vignette that you shared about the importance of the, the mother's response, not mm -hmm. that she's perfect, but that she has a coherent narrative. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm in my mind, all of that fits together is that why that's so important is from my perspective or from a NARM perspective is it means that she doesn't have to push parts of herself away. 
Right, exactly. Which is an indication then that she's not 100% healed, but her relationship to herself is not profoundly distorted exactly. because she isn't in a position of having to push all of these parts away. Exactly. Whereas the person who says everything was great, what's right. wrong with that picture is that they're very clearly mm-hmm. pushing aspects of their experience away. And so that's why I think that coherent narrative mm-hmm. was so important and why the understanding of that is so important for the practitioners that we hope. No, yeah, that's beautiful. Beautifully said. I mean, it's, there literally are brain studies that show the difference between somebody who can have a coherent narrative and not in terms of the integration of the right and left brain and the different parts of the brain and the connection. So that's definitely good. And so that would be great to train to doctors is for them to do narrative medicine and to really understand themselves and where they've come from and how they've gotten here and what the implications are and where they might need support and where they're strong and to just realize life is a journey. And it's never a destination to be perfect. So I think that's a message too for the parent, right? Or the the people you're giving Mm -hmm. therapy to, because so much of my struggle has been this internalization of having to have be so responsible at such a young age, when obviously I wasn't capable of taking on that responsibility, but in a way I did it. And so to the extent that I have been able to heal in that area, I can not be so disturbed by the fact that I don't know about this, but I know about that and I need help and not have to be carrying everything. And that's a life or death thing for a lot of therapists. I did a workshop last week with a lot of policymakers actually on the science of mattering as a potential organizing principle for talking about trauma, where we need to feel valued, but we also need to feel we add value. And mattering is made up of both those pieces Mm. and how so many helpers feel they add value, but they actually don't feel valued. And then what drives a lot of their behavior to add value is the feeling that they're not valued. Oh my gosh. And, yeah. and just seeing that and pretty much mm. everybody, I did a little survey halfway through on how many people related to the items that really calculated feeling valued versus the items calculating adding value. And it was most people felt like they added value, but they actually didn't feel valued. And yet we need that. We need to feel connected to and seen as therapist, if you will, just as much as we need to give that to our clients. I loved hearing that story. I didn't know we hadn't, we haven't talked in a while. Mm-hmm. And it's fantastic. And again, it brings that human element mm-hmm. into these healthcare givers consciousness in a way that is gentle and compassionate, but also very powerful. It was so, very powerful. Yeah, I could imagine it was. Yeah, no, I mean, the whole time they wanted to talk about what they could do in policy and what they could do and the outer world and I kept driving them further in and by the end it's like how can we help when our help is driven by our sense of worthlessness mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I mean it, that's so much of what Larry shared with that example of not like I was trying to please my parents I was trying to not displease them that nuance and as people try to simplify and water down how do we fix trauma that's where the nuance gets lost mm-hmm. well what's so interesting though and i think you were just saying this so we're getting to a deeper root of what you just said larry is that just the awareness is the healing so again when you have a coherent narrative you haven't fixed it you're not you just have an understanding so as soon as the group that i was working with understood they literally said it was mind-blowing that they had never really mm. seen it that they were able to then see it and have compassion for themselves and each other. And by the time we ended, it felt really a shift had been made through just the awareness of it and the acknowledgement of their own humanity that they need to be seen to. One of the basic elements of the, the aftermath of developmental trauma is of course that the child takes the blame and blames themselves for the failure of the environment or or the failure of the caretaking, whatever situation they grew up in. And these attitudes persist and they persist in us as psychotherapists, they persist in us as health care providers of various different kinds. And you, in that little exercise, it wasn't just mind blowing, but it was heart opening. Yeah. You know, in the sense that you were supporting them to have a more compassionate perspective. And that's a a real game changer. And it really shifts the healing paradigm. Mm -hmm. It isn't so much about doing all of these things and that it's on a much subtler relational human level, relationally with the self. 
and we have a term called your being, your well-being. And we were talking about biosynchrony, which is actually a thing you can measure that my brain and your brain are regulating each other biologically. So how I'm actually feeling is what you are actually feeling. I can't lie. And so it really was what you said with just a lot of people realizing for the first time and then the healing. So it was very heart opening. And people were telling stories about their key memories of mattering because I took them through a guided imagery of thinking about that and what they saw and felt were things like, you know, I was in a 7-Eleven and someone looked at me at the end of a long day where I was treating all these patients because a lot of them were healthcare providers. And it was like, wow, that's where that person was able to get their sense of mattering was from mostly strangers. So I think that humanizing is so key. And the principles of NARM, I think, though, are very neuroscience based, but to translate them in terms of that means it's us that actually has to show up as people. And that, I think, is, is the bridge. So what's exciting is that, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics and also the Family Physicians Group, which I work closely with as well, they have as their own self-assigned performance measures, whether patients feel seen. And then the next one is whether their patients feel that they have their social support needs met, that that's something that they will take on to support people and is to get support, a feeling like they have someone to turn to and they feel seen and supported by the doctor, but also in their own lives. And, you know, even though they deal with lots of disease, their conclusion through a very long process was the common core of why we don't get the results we need when we can potentially help people medically is because of the gaps in their own sense of self-love and feeling like they belong. Yeah. Hmm. So it's a very exciting time. And one thing I'm really curious about, I mean, it's, it's very clear that the industry is starting to shift and in, into more of this relational heart opening space, or at mm -hmm. least you're, you're doing a really great job of getting it to go that way. Why? Why now? Why are people more open to it now, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. One is really, to be honest with you, without the data, people can't see themselves. Hmm. So we've had a great catapult in the epidemiology of human suffering and psychology and mental emotional behavioral issues and finding out what it's connected to in the home and the family. So that's one piece of it is really bringing that forward. The other is the science is very powerful. The brain sciences that really link experience and lived experience, relational, emotional experience being impacting the brain really had a huge amount because a lot of the science about child development and human development was already there. And the other is like things like healthcare costs. When you actually analyze where it's going, it's mental, emotional, behavioral addiction. It's all these things that we think of as diseases of despair. And there finally became a breakthrough with financing health systems on a global budgeted basis so that their incentive all of a sudden became to keep people well. And we've played with this for decades. And now it's in enough big health systems that they know exactly what to do. As soon as there are financial incentives aligned, they know what they need to solve hmm. and they need to solve relationships and social connection is one of the first things. Eliminating loneliness is actually a number one goal and outcome for several big health systems in this country right now. Eliminating loneliness. So we will be leading, but we want to border it with research and demonstration. And then more than anything is that provider on the front lines that we hear from all the time that says, I get it. I've always gotten it. What do I do? How do I do this? And to see this as a something we can all learn, we can learn these things is really important. And so I know, Mary, you're just one person, but I actually don't see a plethora of appropriate training out there at the depth that we need. Well, thank you. And I know you know, but and maybe probably many of our listeners know, but people forget that the R in NARM stands for relational. Right. So it's the neuroaffective relational model. And oh, so yeah. mm -hmm. the relational piece is so important. And I also had a just a kind of a parallel answer, Sarah, to your question. In addition to what Christina said, is that I think I've watched this change in consciousness, having been a clinician now for a long time myself. And first it was the increased awareness due to necessity of PTSD. Yeah. And then as we started seeing the costs of PTSD, which was once 
in earlier wars dismissed. And then we started seeing more and more of this. We right. saw it after Vietnam, but it wasn't so well understood. And mostly what it, it, the only therapeutic modality was exposure therapy and still is in many, in many contexts. But we started not just dismissing what is now called PTSD, but being curious about it. And then we saw the need just mushroomed. And then research money started, you know, right. the VA and other places started seeing the need for more research on it. So, and it, it led to this huge revolution in care for that's still incomplete, but at least it's been a, an important start of care for not just veterans, that's important right. in itself, but for so many people, but then many clinicians started understanding that our models of PTSD didn't fully fit right. for working with childhood right. development. Exactly. And so that was another now, and we're still, that wave working is really that. just beginning. No, it is. Mm -hmm. wave of increased consciousness. I know. So all of us who've been working on this, we have to like eat our Wheaties and start to get revived <laughs> again. So I and other colleagues started something called the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice. And some of these people, like really Larry, you should be part of this group if you want to be. It's a lot to try to translate it into policy and practice. But basically, we just got asked to do a whole first 100 days proposal for the new administration to basically try to fast track how to start to launch a collective healing process in the country and the awareness. And so I could share it with you. We just issued it yesterday. And mm. it's like, what can be done in the, with the stroke of a pen in the first 100 days to try to restore. And it's all around working with secondary trauma, healing work trauma, trailing by, you know, vicarious trauma, basically helping the workforce and really making sure that we have healing in all policies. It's really all about healing. And so when I look at that and I think, okay, we've got every county in the country that's required to do something, let's say, when it's pretty, it's getting closer and closer to that. They want to know what to do. And that's kind of where my work is, is trying to articulate the common principles and get it out of this, you got to use this program or that program. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be great if there was something like that, but that it's really these competencies and principles and how do we scale the training? That's really a huge part. There's so much funding coming down the pike. And what I worry about mm -hmm. is it's going to be light it's not going to go to the depth. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who would have to come to help with NARM to be able, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do your training. But I do think they're out there. There's a lot of interest in the field of a lot of really smart people who would help come in, because I do think you have the neuro effective relational model. And I know probably you even have movement in there, right? Because we know the body is very engaged in that. So. Well, the neuro was designed that's all of it yeah. the nervous system but really right. all of the systems of the body right and exactly. the affective of course the emotional piece and then the relational piece yeah so. yeah it's perfect well the reason i like it is because it basically in one fell swoop says that you can't disaggregate these things and most of what i'm seeing in the literature or at least the literature that's trying to be published is disaggregating it somebody trying to find the solution that's this or that or the other versus the integrated whole person human approach, which is so amazing because we're built for it, right? We're built for the competencies that you train. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was essentially just the shift, really. It is. And I think that what's coming to the fore in the minds of our top leaders, and I've actually worked before the election with Senator Harris's office, that they're interested. And the first thing they ask is, what do I do? And we need to start to formulate a more specific answer to that. And in lieu of that, people who are already in place will answer that. And so I guess I'm doing a little bit of a call to arms for anybody who does this work in their own communities to be on the lookout for coalitions of people coming together to assess and address trauma and healing because they need your voice and they need to know about NARM and the core principles and the capacities we do have to bring this into common practice. So you don't need to go off and get another PhD, but you do need to be grounded in really translating the science into therapy and into primary care, which is, I think, what NARM does, but also in a way that's understandable because you distinguish between different types of ways that it shows up. And then that indicates slightly different approaches, not core at a core level. You have similar common elements of your 
approach, but how you handle it differently if somebody's caught in a dissociative mm-hmm. space versus more of a sort of fight or flight, you know, I mean, those are different ways that it can show up and you can go between all of them, but to recognize that is really just beginning. So we need a lot of people to show up. There's hundreds and hundreds of communities in the US and all over the world now that are waking up. And as they do, we want to really scale the response to the answer. What should I fund? What should I do? How do we do this? No pressure. No pressure, Larry. (laughs) Stay the course. (laughs) We're in this for the long haul here. And so you and I have both been doing this long enough to know that change is incremental, but also to be aware of how much really mm-hmm. awareness has shifted, even in the last 10 years. No, definitely. Or, and, and even much more than that, the last 20 years. And I will share with you the thing we sent to the new administration by request. It's very short, two pager, but I want you to see it and I'm able to share it within one more day to give people a sense of the kinds of things that we're talking about on the front lines and to really shift their own identity. If any of you are up there feeling like, oh, I do this work, but it's fringe. I'm here to tell you it's not. And so step up, be confident and know that health plans, health systems, providers are all ears aching for support and help on how to ground the concepts of healing, recognizing trauma and developmental trauma and doing something about it and becoming the people who can. It's really a lot of leadership opportunities, I guess. (laughs) Well, that's a great inspirational note for us to start bringing this to a close, but it's been so great to see you again here to tell people are listening, but we're Sarah and I (laughs) and Christina can see each other at this point. And also to get some updates on some important things Mm -hmm. that are now happening. So Thank you, Christine. And thank you, Sarah, too, for all of your support. Yeah, I'm super inspired because this is something I've been feeling before I found NARM. And when I found NARM, I was like, oh, people are doing healing work the way I want to do it. And so to know now that that research is also dovetailing with this and the healthcare systems are shifting. Yeah, I'm going to just like fly out of here with wings because I'm so excited right now. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest, check the show notes or visit us at www.narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. You can connect with us in many ways. On Instagram, find us under at the Narm Training Institute, on Twitter at Narm Training, and Facebook at Narm Training as well. The Narm Training Institute also offers the Inner Circle, an online self-paced learning program intended for anyone who is interested in joining an international online community focused on healing complex trauma. You can find more information about these trauma-informed learning programs in addition to other resources on the website, www.narmtraining.com. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community and connection with you and changing the world by transforming trauma.